Welcome back to Let's Unpack That. It's a podcast where we, two college graduates with a lot of student loan debt, talk about books that we read as kids and uh, analyze them from a literary and sociopolitical perspective. I'm Nina. I'm Lydia. And this week, ladies and gentlemen, and ladies, or insert non-binary preferred general term here, uh, we are talking about Chapter 5 of Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief, but first, we have to acknowledge the fact that this one right here just had a birthday. Yay. You know, I feel like the 26 is the new 18 because of the whole getting off your parents' insurance thing, and now you yeah. absolutely have to call the doctor yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, 18 is one thing for being an adult, but 26, I think, is, yeah, it's the new 18. He's if, got something to say about it. If you heard that, that was my cat. Yeah. Also he, Percy. He might be jingling around here he's bored and looking for trouble yeah he is um and if we close the door he's gonna meow louder and throw his body weight yep. against it. <laughs> i love him i'm so glad i picked him off off the side of the street yep you are so lucky do you have anything else to add Wanna come up here no, he does not. Nope. He obeys no one. No, he doesn't. He answers to no one. Um, <laughs> and that's Not a care fine. in the world. And now no. he's playing with a ball of fuzz on the floor. Yeah. Anyway. When I just gave him not one, but two toys. <laughs> nah. He does his he own thing. Jingle, jingle like a little fool. Yeah. Is he going to be distracting us for this whole episode? He Possibly. might be. We'll see if he gets bored because we're going to yeah. be talking and not talking to him. Yeah. If he is, I'll let Boo back in the house and yeah. I'll put him back in. But yeah. Boo, Boo will wrangle him. Yeah, he will. Um, anyway, 26 yeah. is the new 18. We love yep. it. And uh, happy birthday. We got our first snowfall on your birthday too. Yeah. Which yeah, I, that was fun. Personally, I was pissed about, but <laughs> you know, it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Halloween would have – it has passed by the time this episode comes out, but yeah. it is on Monday. So that's also coming up. Um, and I survived the LSAT. Yay. Yay. <laughs> um, yeah, so that went well. Um, I did – I was feeling great up until about, I guess – 14 hours prior to the test when I started having an anxiety attack that, um, honestly, I was pretty anxious up until about halfway through the test, yeah. which is either good or bad, but, um, you know, I did my best and I felt pretty good about most of the test anyway. You know, there wasn't anything that was overwhelming. So, um, by the time this comes out, I'll have known my score. I'll, okay. but I was going to ask that. Yeah. But as of right now, I don't know my score. So, um, and probably not something I'll publicly announce. That's kind of one of those things you don't need to share with the public. But, you know, um, my next steps are going to be figuring out how I did and then deciding exactly which schools I'm applying to. And then, God willing, I get in somewhere. <laughs> so that'll be great. So kind of a lot that went on in the past couple of weeks for us. Yeah. It's, honestly. it's been a busy and hectic couple of weeks, I think. Yeah. Um, which... Like, I was grateful to have a little break from recording because mm -hmm. that allowed me to do other things. Yeah. I also launched my bakery website. Yes. <laughs> and what is that URL? Um, <clears throat> that is rusticpeaksourdough.com. Hey. Um, so if, if you are in the Colorado yeah. Springs area and you would like some really fucking good bread, um, yeah. what what have you got on there? You've got your classic loaves, yep, your rosemary. Classic rosemary. Focaccia, focaccia, which is like... Mm -hmm. I love your focaccia, just so you know. Like, I think that's my favorite out of what you sell. Um, yep, yeah. and uh, baguettes. Yeah. And that's what's on there. Yeah. So. Got to do it. Got to um, do it. Yep. And if you don't live in the state of Colorado or don't live anywhere near, too bad. Sorry. <laughs> Sucks to suck. <laughs> well, that's, um, yeah. Eventually, maybe you'll get to the point where you can ship stuff, but... Eventually, that would require me to have a commercial kitchen. Right. Um, which would need to be certified, and I would have to have a wholesale license and right. a whole bunch of other stuff. Right. Um, so that's very far off. I think the next step is going to be the big oven in the yeah. garage, and I'll yeah. kind of stick with that for a while. Yeah. Um, if my big ever big oven ever comes... <laughs> it will. I believe in it this time. Oh! <laughs> I do. I truly do. It'll be fine. 
It'll uh, be fine. I just, I just can't wait for it to be here. I. <sighs> so it's this big. Tell us a little bit about it. It's like this big. Yeah. So it's a bread three oven. rack, um, stone bread oven. Mm, okay. Um, it's for any of you bread people out there. It's a Rothko B forty. Mm, um, Rothko. Yeah, Rothko, not Rothko. Roth-co. Roth with an F. Co. Um, yeah, it's weird. I yeah. I hate that name. Um, but I ordered it in March. Mm-hmm. It was supposed to be here in September. Right. They pushed it back to December. Mm-hmm. Now they pushed it back to January. Yeah. So it's quite possible that I won't get it until ten months to a year after I ordered it. Yeah. Um, Here's hoping love that. it does not happen like that. Yeah. I mean, I as long as it's here before next May, I keep telling myself I'm going to be fine. It's going to be fine. It'll totally be fine. <laughs> It'll be fine. I mean, I would like to have some time to try it out, to test it. You um, will. Before the market season. Mm-hmm. But, you know. If that doesn't happen, then I'll just wing it and it'll it'll all be fine. It'll all be fine. It'll be fine. Just like my LSAT scores yeah. and my law school, like, it'll be fine. Mm-hmm. It's cool. It's great. So, yeah. yeah. Man. Yeah. All right. So well, that's what's going on in our little corner of the world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, oh, also to the fucker who broke into Nancy and Paul Pelosi's house in oh, San yeah. Francisco. Um, first of all... Fuck you. I don't care what political ideology you're on. How dare you break into the house of an 80-year-old man and beat him with a hammer? That's disgusting. Yeah. And really, it points to a really scary side of politics that are coming true. And, you know, I've heard of people in Arizona who are guarding ballot boxes with guns. Jeez. And, you know, if you're not afraid of what that faction is doing... I really think you should be because they are very much trying to interfere with a fundamental American right. And even if you may not necessarily agree with who is in office right now, I think everyone should agree that a threat to democracy is a threat to us all. Mm-hmm. Um, and they are absolutely threatening democracy. And, you know, on I, and I'll say it first here, I'm not the biggest fan of Nancy Pelosi. I'm not. Um, you know, she really doesn't represent my demographic at all, but you can absolutely disagree with somebody and without not, attempting to murder them. without attempting to murder them and so truly i wish uh mr pelosi all the best and a quick recovery because yeah. that's unacceptable and really it's it's horrifying it's very scary mm-hmm. um and well it's like our friend said it's domestic terrorism it really is it is domestic terrorism and so. i wish we would talk more about the january 6th thing being a coup and or attempted coup and not just an insurrection because that was also domestic terrorism i hate that it has taken us so long to get to the point of like summoning yeah trump to finally talk about it like yeah y'all it's been almost two years and we're just now getting to this yeah yeah like it seems like a threat to democracy (laughs) should be maybe t- uh, higher priority than that we're going to talk a bit about democracy in this episode yeah we are <laughs> um so putting your political science degree to use yeah um but i mean it's it's scary so yeah. you know i think we'll be having our uh, voting season here soon mm-hmm. um so make sure you're looking at what's on the ballot um asking questions researching and making sure you're going out and voting you know um, our voices are really important right now more than ever. So, um, on that happy note, you yeah. want to jump into chapters yeah. about more happy notes? Not like we're traumatizing a 12 year old in this chapter. <sighs> Not, at, Not all. at all. Ugh. No. <laughs> all right. Yeah. But chapter five of the lightning thief mm-hmm. in which Percy is nursed back to health by various people. One of them being Annabeth. And remain, uh, regains consciousness sitting on the porch of the farmhouse. He learns that his mother is truly gone and that Grover blames himself for what happened. He also meets Mr. D, the camp director, secretly Dionysius, the actual Greek god, and reunites with Mr. Brenner, who is secretly Chiron, the centaur. Annabeth makes Percy her bitch. Percy learns more about the state of things, such as that the Greek gods are real and also close by, and that he has officially arrived at Camp Half-Blood. Am I pronouncing those names right? 
Uh, most of them I have no idea. I have no idea about Kiron. Um, I've heard it pronounced more like Charon. Mm. Um, but I don't know if that's actually correct. Um, Dionysus. Dionysus, okay. Is, that's, that's like how I say it. I'm not sure if that's 100% correct though. Right. Um, hey, if you're a Greek expert, feel free yeah. to email us or send us a voice memo of how to pronounce things. Because honestly, I would like to know better. Yeah. Um, um, I have like <clears> – I've considered learning ancient Greek, but <laughs> haven't gotten there quite yet. So. Add to the list of things to do. <laughs> it's It's been on the list. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. it's been on the list. Yeah. Um, oh, my God. Like part of me – um, part of me wants to get a doctorate in psychology. Part of me wants mm -hmm. to get a doctorate in theology, <laughs> which would involve learning ancient Greek yeah. slash Hebrew. Um, <laughs> and part of me wants to be a librarian. <laughs> hey, why not? And an archivist. And it's like... Por que no los tres? Por que no los all? All. There's, there's an infinite list. Yeah. I mean, same, um, honestly. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm never gonna get to it. So that's somebody else's prerogative. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, but hey, we're officially meeting Annabeth. Yeah, which is really yeah. exciting. Um, we touched a little bit about it. I think in either our intro or first episode, um, that Annabeth, the character, has a little bit. Unfortunately, has a little bit of conspiracy around her with the TV series that's going to happen. But in this instance, we've just met her now. Um, her calling is not to be a nurse. Uh, mm -hmm. trying to question someone while they are or, not fully conscious. You know, you know that stereotype about how your high school bullies became nurses? <laughs> yeah. Um, There's a case for that here. <laughs> there is kind of a case for that here. Ooh, you're right. You're right. Um, but hey, you know, I, she fed him pudding, so she did something right. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting, though, is what we kind of talked about. She is described in the book as having blonde hair and gray eyes, kind of looking like the typical California girl, which mm -hmm. I think was every, you know, romanticized heroine, especially in the age of when this book was published. So mm -hmm. I remember being more excited when Katniss went from The Hunger Games is actually described as being dark hair and olive skinned because really how often did we get a, a heroine that kind of looked more like us? Um, yeah, and then we like else. kind of tended to get more brunettes in mm -hmm. there. Yeah. And actually in the movie, Annabeth is a brunette. Right, she is. Um, uh, the awful, awful movie that I <laughs> still have not seen. But um, there is a TV series coming out about mm -hmm. Percy Jackson. And remind me, what, what platform is it going to be on? It's going to be on Disney+. Plus. It's going to be on Disney+. Plus. Um, because a, a lot of these books are published in conjunction with Disney Hyperion books. Oh, right. Um, and so it's going to be on Disney+. Plus. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a TV series mm -hmm. instead of a movie. Mm -hmm. Um. And they've announced the main three characters, and they've actually announced Mr. Acting. D, right. and I think have, – have they announced Kieran? I don't know. I could check. Yeah, they've announced a couple of the main characters, but the one that we're talking about here, Annabeth, um, we talked a little bit in our earlier episode about the controversy around her casting because she's going to be played by a black actress mm -hmm. um, and how – like, people jumped on that and were like, no, she should be blonde. <laughs> Fuck off. Okay? Um, that's I, – I think that's part of a larger conversation about people being cast in film adaptations not needing to look exactly like the characters described on the page. Right. Um, and, like, don't get so attached to on-the-page descriptions because – they are like that that's just how the author sees them at the time of writing that is not necessarily what all the readers are going to see that is not necessarily who's best for the role right and it sounds like from what uncle rick announced like she's the best for the role yeah and that's what we should be looking for more than well is she blonde yeah so actually about um miss roard and uncle rick as is it Uncle Rick? Okay. Yeah. So on his uh, website, rickroarden.com, he actually published a news, almost like a blog post, I would say, but a news blurb on May 10th um, of this year after um, 
Leah Jeffries was announced as being the chosen actor to play Annabeth. Um, and because there was sort of this complaint and backlashing. And first, of, I mean, I think everything I you said, I completely agree with, but I think it's also really important to kind of hear it from the words of the author too. Um, and he really has an excellent way to say it. Um, so quoting exactly from his post about this, the whole controversy, uh, and the article itself is titled, Leah Jeffries is Annabeth Chase. Uh, it starts off, and directly quoting here, this post is specifically for those who have a problem with the casting of Leah Jeffries as Annabeth Chase. It's a shame that such posts need to be written, but they do. First, let me be clear that I am speaking here only for myself. These thoughts are mine alone. They do not necessarily reflect or represent the opinions of any Disney, of any part of Disney, the TV show, the production team, or the Jeffries family. Uh, the response to the casting of Leah has, Leah has been overwhelmingly positive and joyous, as it should be. Leah brings so much energy and enthusiasm to the role, so much of Annabeth's strength. She will be a role model for new generations of girls who will see her the kind of hero as see her in the kind of hero they want to be. If you have a problem with this casting, however, take it up with me. You have no one else to blame. Whatever else you take from this post, we should be able to agree that bullying and harassing a child online is inexcusably wrong. As strong as Leah is, as much as we have discussed the potential for this kind of reaction and the intense pressure this role will bring, the negative comments she has received online are out of line. They need to stop now. The core message of Percy Jackson has always been that difference is strength. There is power in plural, plur wow, power in plurality. Thank you. <laughs> the things that distinguish us from one another are often our marks of individual greatness. You should never judge someone by how well they fit into your preconceived notions. That neurodivergent kid who has failed out of six schools, for instance, may very well be the son of Poseidon, and anyone can be a hero. If you don't get that, if you're still upset about the casting that this, of this marvelous trio, then it doesn't matter how many times you've read the books. You didn't learn from them. And I feel like that's a pretty powerful statement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. he also goes on to say that he's excited and, you know, watch the show or not, but he's excited for the casting of Annabeth. And I know that was really long, but I felt like that was really important to read, um, especially if you're listening to this and have been following the TV series and we're kind of upset about the casting, it's important to recognize. And I think it also really underlays what this book is about too, which is what I'm loving about it so far is that, yeah, it is, this book is about differences. Mm -hmm. This book is about things not being the way we all preconceive them to be and incredible strength and greatness coming from those differences. Um, so honestly, I'm more excited now after reading that statement from uncle rick to watch this tv show honestly like yeah. and it also kind of changes my perspective of the book too mm. and just makes me feel as a neurodivergent person makes me feel really proud to be reading it and talking about it with you yeah nice yeah so um, that was a very long tangent i apologize for that <laughs> actually i'm not that sorry but i no. just talked a lot i'm glad to hear that they like prepared her for yeah. media backlash mm -hmm. because that is like We've seen it over and over again with these big franchises. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm thinking specifically of Star Wars mm. with John Boyega. Oh, my gosh. And yeah. how how much, like, backlash his casting got to the point that they basically wrote him out of the trilogy. Um, Which is shameful. Yeah. Like, they bowed to the racists. Um, and, like, I mean, we're about to have a black Doctor Who. Yeah. Um, right. And so, like, as more popular franchises bring more actors of color into the forefront, um, I think it's important to know that, like, this kid was prepared for this. Yeah. That, and that they were prepared for this to happen. And it sucks that she had um, to be. And it, it sucks that such a young kid has to be like, okay, people are going to hate this. People are going to hate you because of this. And, like, it sucks that adults have to experience that. But for, for people to attack a kid? Yeah. Like, are you fucking kidding me? I'm so excited to see what she's going to do with the character. Yeah, I think she's going to be great. Um, um, I'm not familiar with any of her other work, but I'm excited. Me neither, but, like... <laughs> it'll be great. I mean, I'm not familiar with any of the other of the trio's work. The yeah. only one I'm familiar with is Mr. D. Yeah. From The Good Place. Yeah. Um. But, yeah, 
It's it's going to be good. It's going to be good. And I'm excited for it. Yeah. That it comes also, out in 2023. Yeah. So. It also kind of reminds me of the whole when people started flipping out when the Little Mermaid live action. Ugh. Yeah. Um, oh my God. That was also a lot. But you know what was so sweet was watching the reactions of yeah. little yeah. black boys and girls who were watching the trailer mm-hmm. and how excited they got when they saw Ariel for the first time. Yeah. And like, that's why you do it. Yeah. That's, that's why people deal with the media and the fans backlash is because it's worth it for the people. Yeah. When you see yourself represented in media, it's really exciting. I mean, I loved Encanto and how much that seemed to represent, you know, my Latina roots, Mm -hmm. you know, even though I'm very Americanized and, um, you know, didn't grow up in that culture, it's still something that I hold really dear to myself. And, Mm -hmm. You know, I recognize a lot of my own family dynamics with the American side of my family um, within Engando. So, yeah, it's important. Um, Differences make us stronger. Yeah. 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 Cool. Anyway, Percy's on the porch now and hanging out. He's drinking some ambrosia or nectar, whatever you think it is. Oh, really? Um, So I'm pretty sure ambrosia and nectar are in these books. Pretty okay. sure that's what that is. Um, so the pudding that tastes like butter popcorn mm-hmm. and the drink that tastes like his mom's chocolate chip cookies, mm-hmm. um, which Grover implies like it's a unique taste for everybody. Mm-hmm. It's supposed to feel comfortable mm. um, and comforting. And so interestingly, in Homer, nectar is the drink and ambrosia is the food. In Sappho, nectar is the, is the food and ambrosia is the drink. <laughs> oh, okay. So, like, they're pretty much interchangeable. But, like, what does it do? Is it Does it have, it's, like, healing properties? It's the food of the gods and oh. it imbues immortality and longevity. Oh. So, like, there are legends of, like, people eating or drinking it and then, like, they resume their youthful appearance when they were old mm, before. Okay. Or, like, they cure ailments. Um, which in this case is what it's being used for. And um, it's also implied that he could only drink a certain amount of it. Yeah, I was just about to um, say Grover cuts him off at one point. Yeah, yeah. Um, which, like, I mean, he's not an immortal. If he yeah. um, consumes too much of it, like, it won't make him immortal. It'll make him sick. Oh, okay. So um, it's not so much that he might become immortal if he drinks too much of it. It's right. just that it might – he might – it might essentially reverse the effects of it. Like he'll he'll have too much it, too much yeah, of a good it, thing. It, yeah, too Got much it. of a good thing. Got exactly. It. Okay. Oh, interesting. Um, so yeah. Yeah. You know what else I caught on uh, when Grover stomped his foot and his shoe came off in this chapter? Mm-hmm. He kept on saying he said, "Oh, sticks." S T Y X, and I caught that, and I realized he had said it a couple times. So I wanted to look it up, mm-hmm. um, and according to Britannica. Styx is actually one of the rivers of the underworld. Mm -hmm. The name means shuddering and expresses a loathing of death. So it's it's interesting, I think, as a swear word, but it's also kind of it's kind of neat that that's one of it's kind of like saying oh hell. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's but you can't really say oh underworld. So you say oh Styx, yeah, which I thought was really cool. Um, In Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey, the gods swear by the water of the Styx as their most binding oath. Mm-hmm. So like you, they swear on it and it's sort of like you can't you can't break it. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also a legend that Alexander the Great was poisoned by Styx water. And then in another legend mentioned by the Roman poet Statius um, in the first century AD. Um, let's see. Again with the names. Thetis dipped her son Achilles into the sticks to render him invulnerable because she held but because she held him by the heel, he remained vulnerable there. Hence we have the Achilles heel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So kind of cool. I had no idea about any of that. So neat. Yeah. I liked it. Maybe I'll start saying, oh, sticks. <laughs> I'm gonna stick with fuck. <laughs> All right. You do that. <laughs> All right. So they uh I think we should like take a minute here Mm -hmm. because we're at 28 minutes okay um yeah and so um we will be right back and either this will be the break or the next one will be the break because we have a lot to cover oh yeah yeah we do (laughs) yeah (laughs) all right all right right. welcome back if that was the break (laughs) um so pinochle 
<laughs> well, let's describe the context a little bit here too, though. So Percy's woken up and he's chatting with Grover first and now he's meeting up with people that he thought he knew and turns out they're not anything mm-hmm. like that. So I'll scooch this way a little yeah. bit. So, <laughs> so, I mean, well, yeah, yeah, they're playing Pinochle. Okay. Which is a card game. Mm-hmm. According to Wikipedia, it is a Swiss slash German game brought to America by German immigrants in the 19th century. Hmm. Um, and it was also the favorite card game of American Jewish and Irish immigrants. Okay. So I don't know how card games work. I don't even know how to play poker. Neither do I. They have to reteach me how to play slapjack every time. Yeah. We go camping. <laughs> um, but fun fact, during World War I, the game was banned in Syracuse, New York because it was German. Oh. And because of anti-German sentiment. Uh-huh. And other cities had similar temporary bans. Oh, wow. Um, so... Uh, Mr. D mentions Prohibition. Oh, right. It just so happens that Prohibition started a couple years after World War I, mm. by which time it might have been, like, back. Oh, yeah. So maybe he learned it during Prohibition. That's kind of funny. So how do you play it? I don't know. No. Uh, it involves 48 cards, and some of the moves are called tricks. Oh, okay. Which is why he goes, like, trick, trick, trick. Ah. Um, All right. And that- that's... That's all I was able to glean from the Wikipedia page because, Weird. like, if if I saw it played, I could probably get more. Yeah. Um, but I have no idea how to play it. All and right. I don't think it's like a symbolic thing. I think it's just something that they do. I think our new goal needs to be figuring out how to play Pinochle. I don't know if I want to. <laughs> all right. Fine. Um. Anyway. <laughs> Continuing on with Percy's trauma, now that he's woken yeah. up in a strange place to find out his mother is dead and people around him are not who they say they are and his best friend is half barnyard animal, as he likes to say. Uh, further trauma for Percy is on page 63 of my version of the book, um, in where I quote, I scooted a little further away from him because if there was one thing I had learned from living with Gabe, it was how to tell when an adult has been hitting the happy juice. If Mr. D was a stranger to alcohol... I was a satyr. So seriously, what the fuck has Percy been through? And what was Sally thinking? Like, great, cool. We have someone who is familiar with alcohol abuse. Great. And avoiding adults with alcohol abuse. Wonderful. I love that. I just love that. Why? Uh, it's like, well, you, nobody clearly says that Sally is dead. Mm-hmm. I don't think she is. I don't think so either. Um, but Mr. D says that on page 66 what sally did is that's how they usually get killed Mm. which is like okay she was trying to keep him safe she did her best but this information was available right like presumably somebody could have told her like you send him to this camp or he gets killed there's Mm -hmm. no other way this has happened so many times clearly this has happened before yeah this has happened before it'll happen to your kid too he's not special in that way um although he is because he survived it yeah um, but it's like, who did she talk to about this? What information did they give her? Did they keep her in the dark? Like she kept Percy in the dark or about like how many kids have died? Yeah. Or like, was she fully aware of how many kids have died and she still like did this? I'm decided to keep him with her or not in the camp. And I'm, it kind of seems less like and a, less on team Sally. You know, honestly, me too. I was going to say the same thing. It seems like, you know, she made some decisions that put him directly in danger and mm-hmm. I get the maternal instinct and all that, but like, geez, lady, you kind of, you kind of put him in some shit. Um, yeah. And some unnecessary shit. Yeah. Because if he had, presumably if he had gone to this camp, then she wouldn't need to be with Gabe. Yeah. And he wouldn't be traumatized from his time with Gabe. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's sort of like I did what I thought was best, but really, did she think she was doing like, what no, was you, best? You did what you wanted to do. Yeah, in what this you case. wanted to believe was best. Yeah, when it yeah. wasn't. And yeah. I don't know. Do we know? Would she not have been able to visit him or anything like that? I'm. I guess it's I, the implication. Well, in the last chapter, she says that she can't cross the boundary line. Oh. But, like, he could leave the camp. Can for, he? Like, I yeah. Mean, they like, can, I'm, I don't they know can anything. come and go. Okay. Um, it's just he's not as safe outside of it. Yeah. It, um, yeah. I just... To me, I, I 
am kind of getting less enthused about her decisions, especially yeah, since the no. poor child is now traumatized. Yeah, yeah. Now he's like, not only is he walking up to a table where somebody is an alcoholic or was an alcoholic mm -hmm. and he knows that immediately, they're playing cards just like when he walked into the apartment. Um, yeah. So cool. Flashbacks. So love yeah. that. No wonder he's uncomfortable. Yeah. No mm -hmm. wonder. Um, I did love the line about Annabeth um, where Percy was kind of preparing for her to kind of stoke his ego a little bit. And oh, be like, you're my so God, great. You're so cool. You and then put the Minotaur. Yeah, oh, my God. Great can job. I can't believe you did that. And instead, she said, you drool when you sleep. Yeah. That's, um, that's in which Percy Annabeth. <laughs> officially becomes Annabeth's bitch. And I'm here mm -hmm. for it. I love it. Put down the men whenever you can. Go, girl. I love it. Yeah. Um that was hilarious. I laughed out loud at that one. <laughs> we also re-meet Mr. Brunner, who is mm -hmm. actually shockingly not who he said he was. Oh, His name is Kieran or Chiron or mm -hmm. something. Uh, but anyway, he's not Dr. Brenner. He's not human. Poor Percy. Um, did according you say Dr. Brenner? Did I say? I said Mr. You definitely said doctor that time. Isn't that the dude from Stranger Things? Papa? Yeah, I thought it was Brenner with an E. It's Dr. Yeah, you Brenner. You said Dr. Brenner. Oh, okay. Well, I also enjoy Stranger Things. So sorry. Um, it's, it is confusing with... I, I had to look back and, like, you misspelled it once in the notes. And I was like, wait, is it Brenner or Brunner? <laughs> I can't remember yeah. which is the Stranger Things guy and which is this guy. They're both liars. So, yeah, yeah there we go. But we'll see if, he rede if uh, Mr. Brenner in this case, redeems himself. Mm -hmm. We'll have to see. But anyway, his name is Chiron. And according to Wikipedia, in Greek mythology, Chiron was held to be the super superlative centaur among his brethren since he was called the, quote, wisest and justice of all the centaurs. Mm. He is notable throughout Greek mythology for his youth-nurturing nature. So therefore, oh. he became a teacher um, yeah, in this version. Sense. His skills tend to match those of his foster father, Apollo, who taught the young centaur the art of medicine, herbs, music, archery, hunting, gymnastics, and prophecy, and made him rise above his beastly nature. Huron was known for his knowledge and skills with medicine and thus was credited with the discovery of botany and pharmacy, the science of herbs and medicine. Hmm. So kind of kind of makes sense that he would be looking over Percy as a teacher because that's what he does. His nature is to be yeah. youth nurturing and take mm -hmm. care of them. Uh, this line I thought was really funny. <laughs> like satyrs, centaurs were notorious for being wild, lusty, overindulgent drinkers and um, carouser, car carousers. carousers, violent when intoxicated and generally uncultured delinquents. Chiron, by contrast, was intelligent, civilized, and kind because he was not related directly to the other centaurs due to his parentage. He was actually the son of the titan Kronos and the um, Oceanid uh, Philyra. Um, when Kronos took the form of a horse and impregnated her. So that's cool. But I really want to focus on the fact that apparently Grover is holding back on his baser instincts of lust and overindulgence. <laughs> How old is Grover? I don't think they've established it. We don't it. know yet. Yeah, he's like, supposed to... He's described in the book as looking maybe like an older middle schooler. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And he's being played by a kid yeah. in the TV show. Mm -hmm. So, like... Who knows? Are they all the same age? He we might be. Either. I mean, but it could be one of those things where even though he's 200 years old, as far as a satyr is, he would still be considered a child. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That could be a thing. Yeah. Or like the elves, you know? Yeah. Lord of the Rings, D&D, &D, all that. Vampires. Yep. Something like that. <laughs> so that's how long have you been? 17? Yeah. Kind of thing? <laughs> yeah. A uh, while. Yeah. Um. And we're again hearing that names are powerful. So as they're kind of sitting mm -hmm. and talking around, he Percy asks Mr. D, oh, what does your name stand for? And Mr. D kind of like snaps at him and says like, names are powerful. Don't just throw them around. Mm -hmm. um, and in truth, I think they really kind of are powerful. I was thinking about this uh, while I was writing my notes. We just, we grow so accustomed to hearing our names and using names that we don't really consider what it would be like to go without. Mm -hmm. um, and something that I kind of thought of was, just, you know, because of the line of work I want to go into, um, Jane and John Doe's, which are people who have been found uh, deceased and have not been able to be identified. And some of them go unidentified for decades. You know, there are cold mm -hmm. cases with people who have been found uh, deceased and, and have no name. 
because of that. They're not able to be reunited with their family. They're not buried under a gravestone with their name on it. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think, you know, in that respect, I really actually do agree with Mr. D, even though he's been kind of dramatic about it. Names are really powerful because we don't really know what it would be like to go without it. Mm -hmm. So it it was something that I actually kind of touched, I, I thought about for a while, how powerful the idea of a name can be and how it can give power. Again, kind of reminded me a little bit of Harry Potter and Voldemort, how people didn't want to say his name. Um, Take a drink. Yep. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Take a shot. If you're not driving. No. But also just the idea of it and and how certain names do have power and all of that. Or like Mm -hmm. after a a tragedy of somebody, I think we see it a lot in media if there's been some kind of, you know – Oh, this never happens, but, you know, school shooting, people try to avoid using the name of the perpetrator who committed the crime because it gives that person power and gives them notoriety in the media. And Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of call for people, especially who are survivors of this kind of violence, who are saying you can't, you shouldn't say the names of people who've committed these heinous acts in the media because not only are you giving them what they wanted, which was attention Mm -hmm. and notoriety, it's also encouraging more people to follow in their footsteps in a way because they see that this person is getting idolization or attention through the media. Mm-hmm. So it is, I honestly actually really agree with him that names do have a lot of power. And it's interesting too, that on page 68, Mr. D uses Percy's full name and Percy flinches. Um, mm-hmm. And he also says that he never tells anyone his full name. So he definitely, Mr. D definitely demonstrates the power of a full name. Mm-hmm. And also occasionally, like, he'll say Zeus and, like, there's lightning or thunder right. yeah. in a clear sky. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, Zeus is definitely listening and yeah, absolutely. <laughs> to all of their stuff. Which is interesting to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Also, Mr. D scoffing at the idea of science had me triggered after two years of science deniers, not gonna lie. Yeah. Yeah. That, that makes sense. I... I I go a little bit easier on this guy mm-hmm. um, because he's seen so many centuries and thousands of years of That's stuff. That's true. <laughs> um, and, like, to, to provide a little bit more nuance to that point, mm-hmm. um, it doesn't make me as uncomfortable uh, because I, I thought of that episode of Friends where ross is arguing with phoebe because phoebe doesn't believe in evolution oh, and ross okay. is like you have to believe this you have to it's science yeah. yeah um and eventually she's like you you don't think there's like even a teeny 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 tiny possibility that you could be wrong um and that kind of shuts him up mm. that's kind of where i'm coming from with this yeah it's like everything is still a theory and theories by definition cannot be proven right they have to be proven Three. not wrong. Right. Um, and so, like, while evolution is the operative theory mm-hmm. that has not yet been proven wrong, mm-hmm. like, very well someday they might yeah. prove and, it wrong. I mean, yeah, and obviously um, science will continue to change and develop and grow. I mean, even just right, like science yeah. of DNA has changed within the past 20, 30 years has completely redefined itself. So yeah, I get what you're saying. Right. Uh, the The real problem comes along when, um, like, when you're constantly being proven wrong and insisting that you're not. Right. And that's where a lot of modern anti-science and anti-vaxxers are coming from. Yeah. Is from being overwhelmed by evidence to the contrary and refusing to acknowledge it. Yeah. Um, that I have no respect for. No, absolutely um, not. But overall, and like on both sides of the argument, we can't be so tied to our beliefs that we willingly ignore any evidence in front of us. Sure. Um, So that goes for the science deniers. That goes for the scientists. That's true. Um, Like you can't just want something to be true and it is. Yeah. Um, So that is my take on this. Yeah, I see what you're saying. It is. It's different than being like denying what's out there, but it's also yeah. it's also his wisdom of knowing like things have changed and will continue to change. Yeah. So I get yeah. that. I get what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who is this guy anyway? Yeah. So Mr. D um, is Dionysus. The myth of Dionysus gets very confusing very quickly. <laughs> that doesn't sound anything like Greek mythology. I know it's nothing like this, and we're about to learn um, 
perhaps like where my education got weird in here. Okay. Um, so Dionysus is the Greek god of wine, viticulture, fertility, religious ecstasy, and theater. Um, and so in the most popular version of the myth, which is I think what we're working with mm-hmm. here, um, is that Dionysus is the son of Zeus and the mortal Semele. Oh. And so while Semele was pregnant, the jealous Hera was like, well, you can't prove that your kid is going to be the son of a god. Mm -hmm. Um, You should tell Zeus, like, if he really is the dad, to show you his true form and, like, prove to you that he's a god. And so she asks him to, and he does, and she turns to dust because she can't handle the full, like, godly form. Oh, okay. Um, so that was Hera's sneaky way of getting <laughs> Semele to die. Wow. Um, but the fetus survived. Okay. And so Zeus sewed him into his thigh. All right. For the rest of his gestation. Mm-hmm. And then when he was done cooking in there. Okay. Um, he gave him to Hermes to raise and Hermes gave him to another goddess, Rhea. Um, so what you're telling basically me this- is Zeus doesn't give a fuck about gender norms and I'm with it. Yes, right. Zeus, um, seahorse dad. True. Um, and that's why they call Dionysus the twice born. Right, okay. Because he was like extracted from his mother mm-hmm. and, then and then also born, yeah. born from his father. Okay. So weird, biologically wouldn't work, <laughs> um, but whatever. The gods got it. So in the Orphic version of the myth, which mm-hmm. I don't think is what we're dealing with, mm-hmm. uh, but that's the version told by Orpheus, Dionysus is the son of Zeus and Persephone, mm. or Demeter, depending on the version. Um, and he was chopped up to pieces and eaten by the Titans as a baby. Okay. And Athena saved his heart, and then he was resurrected through Semele. Okay. That's Okay. So weird. <laughs> that's a, that's a story. He's also like not Greek. Okay. Um. So there's like this is all super ambiguous, but mm-hmm. like, um, he like traveled in his youth some. He wasn't necessarily raised in Greece. He wasn't necessarily even from Greece. Um, and so at some point he might've been raised in Ethiopia or Egypt. Oh. And this tracks actually with Dionysus being the Greek interpretation of the Egyptian god Osiris. Really? So some people suggest that Dionysus and Osiris are the same god. Okay. They're, he's just the Greek version of that yeah. god. Um, Osiris... Um, and uh, among those sources are Herodotus and Plutarch, who we talked about in the Hungry Games series, mm-hmm. um, the historians who wrote down stuff. Right. So Osiris is the Egyptian god of fertility, agriculture, the afterlife, and the dead. And he was cut into pieces and scattered around Egypt. Right. Okay. Um, except for his penis, which was thrown in the Nile. All right. And his wife slash sister, Isis, found, found his, his body, body, put him back together. Mm-hmm. Except she could never find his penis. And that is what the obelisk is. Okay. And I learned that in sixth grade. Wow. So (laughs) many answers to questions I had. (laughs) And they are answered. That's interesting. That's, yeah. I remember that story. I was the Egyptian kid. So Mm -hmm. I love, I, that's kind of crazy. And it, it it fits with the Orphic version that you were just telling me about. So Mm -hmm. that's interesting. Okay. I had no idea. Yeah. So being, being chopped into pieces and Mm -hmm. all of that, um, suggests that they might've been the same deity. Right. Um, and other sources suggest that maybe Dionysus and Hades are the same person, um, which tracks with Osiris being Lord of the dead. Right. So everything's mixed up. Everybody is everybody. Everybody's related. Yeah. Everybody's yeah. connected. Mm-hmm. Um, who knows what... I mean, likely they're all true. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, as a youth, Dionysus was a pupil of Charon. Oh. Um, and then... I I caught on page 69. Mm-hmm. Hey, nice. Um, which Mr. D would love. Hey, um, Mr. D would love on page 69. Yeah. Nice. He, he, um, Percy says, "I, but I don't believe in gods. And he says, oh, but you'd better before one of them incinerates you. 
Oh. Possibly a reference to what happened to Mr. D's mom. <laughs> oh, man. Yikes. Okay, so he wasn't threatening Percy. He was more saying, like, hey, maybe he was threatening him, but he wasn't, well, he wasn't think... implying that he's going to be the one to incinerate him. I mean, he probably could. He probably because could. Because then he gets into his head and shows him all these images. Right. Um. So it's like watch your back because yeah. you can't handle the godly form you can't if, handle the truth even though you are a demigod you cannot stand right. the godly form right um which like seems to be a common thing mm -hmm. reminds me of the christian mythology mm -hmm. um <laughs> of moses and the burning bush oh right and like how nobody can actually look god in the face okay um like everybody sees a back or a hand and nobody like sees God fully face to face because mm -hmm. seeing that would kill them. Right. Um hmm. so everything is the same. Everything is the same. Um it's all culture. True. Culture. It's all true. It's all true. Yeah. Um and it's fine. speaking of culture, Western uh, civilization. Oh my god, can I tell you how just like I I get what Rick is saying here, and like I, I understand how it's fitting into the storyline. I but it's hate, not true. <laughs> I hated it so much, and like you know, I, it's a I, oh god, I hated it. So politics time. We're backing up. Not, we're backing up a little bit, but politics time. Um, I want to read a little bit of um, from page seventy two of my version of the book. Mm -hmm. um, so essentially. Um, Huron says to Percy that um, there's the Mount Olympus in Greece and then there's the home of the gods, a convergence point of their powers, which did indeed used to be on Mount Olympus. It is still called Mount Olympus out of respect to the old ways, but the palace moves, Percy, just as the gods do. And then he goes on to say, come now, Percy, what you call, quote, Western civilization. Do you think it's just an abstract concept? No, it's a living force, a collective consciousness that has burned bright for thousands of years. The gods are part of it. You might even say that they are the source of it, or at least they are tied so tightly to it that they couldn't possibly fade, not unless all of Western civilization was obliterated. The fire started in Greece. Then, as you well know, or as I hope you know, since you passed my course, the heart of the fire moved to Rome, and so did the gods. Oh, different names, perhaps, Jupiter for Zeus, Venus for Aphrodite, and so on, but the same forces, the same gods. And then they died. No, died? No. Did the West die? The gods simply moved to Germany, to France, to Spain for a while. Wherever the flame was the brightest, the gods were there. They spent several centuries in Engl um, England. And then he eventually, he essentially goes on to say, like, you see Greek-inspired architecture and symbols such as the eagle all around. Called it. And essentially now he's saying that um, America is now the heart of the flame. It is the great power of the West. And so Olympus is here. And here we are. Mm-hmm. I hate that a lot. Mm, like, let's unpack it. <laughs> oh God! I just you know, and I get I get what he's trying to say, and it fit, it makes the story fits in. But first of all, mm -hmm. it takes away culture from where culture is meant to be. It's a little bit like the British Museum here, mm -hmm. taking stuff. Um, but honestly, it reminds me so much of the concept of American exceptionalism, which as a whole I absolutely despise. Um, so according to The Myth of American Exceptionalism by Stephen M. Walt, um, this was published to foreignpolicy.com in 2011, quote, most statements of American exceptionalism presume that America's values, political system, and history are unique and worthy of universal admiration. They also imply that the United States is both destined and entitled to play a distinct and positive mm -hmm. role in the world on the world stage. The only thing wrong with this self-congratulatory portrait of America's global role is that it is mostly a myth. Although the United States possesses certain unique qualities from high levels of rel religiosity to political culture that privilege privileges individual freedom, the conduct of the United States foreign policy has been determined primarily by its relative power and by the inherently comp uh, competitive nature of international politics. By focusing on their supposedly exceptional qualities, Americans blind themselves to the ways that they are a lot like everyone else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. This unchallenged faith of the American exceptionalism makes it hard for Americans to understand why others are less enthusiastic about U.S. dominance, often alarmed by U.S. policies, and frequently irritated by what they see as U.S. hypocrisy. 
whether the subject is possession of nuclear weapons, conformity with international law, of America's tendency to condemn the conduct of others while ignoring its own failings. Oh boy, the Native Americans. That was my quote, not the article. Going back into the article, ironically, the U.S. foreign policy would probably be more effective if Americans were less convinced of their own unique virtues and less eager to proclaim them. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, my goodness. Um, So I actually wasn't an international politics major. I studied mostly U.S. politics, but uh, I was really lucky to study abroad in Switzerland and also spent some time in uh, the U.K. while we were in school, which was awesome. But I'm also really lucky to have a parent who is from Europe. He's from Slovakia and immigrated here uh, without knowing a word of English um, you know, in the 80s. So I actually have direct family members. I have first cousins who live uh, in Europe and I have been, I visited them since the time I was little. So I've all, I I grew up in a place that I think it it was important for me to see because I was able to see these other cultures very young um, and experience them. Um, So, and and frankly, everything that uh, Stephen Walt says here is correct. And I wish everyone had the opportunity to spend time abroad. You know, I was really lucky to be there for a while. You were abroad too Mm -hmm. in South America, but I wish... Yeah, where the influence of the CIA enforcing democracy and controlling elections, it's a lot more obvious in South America um, with Chile, with Venezuela, with Colombia, Mm -hmm. with, I mean, just so much foreign influence and so much resentment for the United States because of that. Yeah. Because they did not install democratic leaders. They installed communists. Yeah. And dictators. And they helped those dictators come into power and stay in power and by rigging those unfair elections. Exactly. Um, And the people rightly resent that. Yeah. Um, But the United States being a global superpower can get away with it. No. Um, it also reminded me of how, like, they say that empires can only last 250 years, mm-hmm. and we're coming up on that. Yeah. Um, like, because, I mean, Rome didn't last forever. No. The United States empire, because that's what it is, will also not last forever. Yeah. And we talked a, lot, a little bit about this in the episode of The Hunger Games. Um, I can't remember which number it is, but it is called When and How Will the United States Fall? Mm. Where we speculated about that um, yeah. and about like the role that the U.S. has in the world as empire. Yeah, exactly. And I want to point out here that I, it's not to say that I hate my country. I do not hate. I love my country very much. You know, this right. is where I was born. But I love my country enough to want to point out our weaknesses and see where we can improve mm-hmm. and be better. Um, and that's a greater patriotism than... Just, just blind, ignoring blind nationalism yeah. because that's the blind nationalism is what's going to hurt us in the end and what or it's not i don't i don't want to say that because that's a little bit ableist um the thoughtless nationalism the, yeah um continued holding on to like, thinking we are exceptional when yeah and ignoring the sins of our past is what's going to hurt us in the end you know yeah yeah. And, you know, I was in Europe during the 2016 election season and people around me were just incredulous about what was going on. And they were asking me about it, you know, when it came to Donald Trump's campaign. Um, they were horrified and they kept asking me if it was a joke and how people felt like you guys aren't actually going to vote for this guy. Right. And at the time mm-hmm. I was like, oh, there's no way he would win because, God, there was no way he could win. Mm-hmm. And then he did. And our international standing is probably permanently damaged because of that. Oh, definitely. And because of this idea that we're the best country on earth or we deserve all the accolades when we don't. There are so many working systems of government. There's so many amazing people in the world that are not Americans and they're, you know, beautiful cultures and cities and places to go. And I just, I wish there were more people who were able to see it because, you know, it's just it's just one of those things that I think really needs to be discussed. Okay. So, you know, it just – it's it, – again, like I, I understand for the sake of the book why this was written, but it just mm-hmm. it, it just struck me really out of wrong chord. And, and I think because we're seeing our we, – our, we are seeing the cracks in the foundation of the American ideology, just kind of what we were talking about at the start of the show. You know, we're seeing people who are – being threatened out of voting or dropping off ballot boxes. We had a spouse of the Speaker of the House 
be attacked in their own home. You know, there are attacks on democracy. The foundation is crumbling and this is part of it. And Mm -hmm. that's why I think we need to address the fact that American exceptionalism is a myth. And, you know, not only do people need to see outside of this myth that we've created for ourselves, we need to start embracing our differences. Again, like Uncle Rick said, the differences make us stronger building a new foundation rather yeah. than just accepting the old one and pretending there's nothing wrong with it. No. Um, because there's so much wrong with it. There's so much wrong with it. Um, and the phrase Western culture, mm-hmm. um, I haven't done a lot of research into that. Others have. Mm-hmm. But I think that in itself is a myth. And I think Dionysus proves that. Yeah. Him being the same as Osiris, like Western culture mm-hmm. is... Well, first of all, it can sometimes be a dog whistle for white culture yeah. um, and like white supremacy. Mm. I, I don't think that's what Rick meant. No, I don't think so. Um, but that's one possible way of interpreting it because mm-hmm. like the countries listed are all primarily white. Mm-hmm. Whereas we've completely ignored the Osiris side of Dionysus yeah. and his roots in Egypt. Right. Um, like kind of like how... We don't wonder, like, if the aliens help the Greeks build, like, the Pantheon and all of this. Oh, yeah. But we do wonder if aliens help the Egyptians build the pyramids. Like, no, no. And there was (laughs) no... It was just a lot of slaves. Yeah. And and there was no way for Rick to know all of that. I think at the time when this was written in 2004, this was not the conversation. Yeah, this was not the conversation that was being held. It wasn't the conversation. So, absolutely, I don't blame... Mm -hmm. I don't blame rick at all for how he wrote this i don't truly but i think now it's really important to bring this up of where this could be really potentially damaging as a storyline and i think like i'm hoping that they use that for the tv show that um, would be awesome for like maybe correcting some of this stuff yeah i i wouldn't be surprised and i wouldn't be i wouldn't fault them if they created a new reason for the gods being in the United States, because like also this isn't the only canon that uses that. Mm-hmm. Um, American Gods by Neil Gaiman. That's the entire concept. Okay, is like that's why the gods are in the United States. Mm. Um, I think being more like acknowledging of okay, yes, like they're they're attracted to power, not mm-hmm. to civilization. Yeah, um, yeah. Because I think that would be more accurate. I think so too. That'd be interesting. Oh, man. (laughs) Also, civilization didn't start with fucking Greece. (laughs) Yeah. Western civilization, any civilization, no. It it didn't start in Greece. Like, (laughs) nothing. Um, So we end this chapter... Yeah. With you having to Google something about a horse. No, what? that's because I was making sure I – I don't actually know too much about horse anatomy. Oh. Um, but I wanted to make sure that I had the right bones here because I saw your question here. Yeah. Um, you, What is a fetlock? What is a fetlock? And that's because at the end of the chapter here um, – Kieran says, what a relief. I had been cooped up in there so long, my fetlocks had fallen asleep. Now come, Percy Jackson. Let's meet the other campers. That is an ending to a chapter. Yep. <laughs> that yeah. is that is an ending. Um, but And I looked it up to make sure I had the right one because, frankly, as far as horse anatomy goes, I could be better about it. Um, but the fetlock, as you asked me in the notes, is uh, a part of their uh, leg structure. Um, it's essentially the lower part of their leg above oh. where their hoof is. So, so like the ankle part above yeah, where the hoof is. Yeah, comes. and essentially if you're looking at where a horse takes a step, that's actually kind of – it's a um, – It'll flex right I'm, – and I'm showing yeah. a picture of it, but it'll flex I'll, right I'll around here. I'll put the picture up if yeah. I can, yeah. if I can figure out how to. <laughs> yeah, but they'll, they're, they flex pretty much right there. So it kind of makes sense if he was crouched down that he would have fallen asleep. So. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, no. Our camera. Well, the last couple minutes of this episode will just be maybe a picture of something. But I think we can finish yeah. on that note. Yeah. Yeah. It's not worth waiting another no. 15 minutes and turning the camera back on. Yeah. Okay. Um, so a lot of heavy stuff in this one. Yeah. I don't know if it was necessarily – maybe it was meant to be pretty heavy. And I think it's interesting. This is what we do is looking back at the books and seeing how they're playing out. And I think this is really kind of the first chapter where we've had that chance to really dive into 
how things were versus how they are now yeah. in such a way. Yeah. Um, so I'm glad I was able to scratch that itch. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Um, is that all we have for this chapter? Yeah. I think so? Yep. Okay. Um, well. Lots of fun. Yeah, lots of fun. The usual <laughs> admin stuff. We put out an episode every two weeks. You can find it on SoundCloud and on YouTube, um, as well as Apple Podcasts. Basically anywhere you download podcasts, mm -hmm. um, you'll find our stuff. And um, we are on Twitter at Let's Unpack Pod. We are on TikTok at Let's Unpack Pod. Yep. We are on... We have an email. We have an email. <laughs> Do it for the vamps at gmail.com. Yeah. You can email us, talk to us. Um, Let us know what you think. Get involved. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah. Comment what you think about the whole gods being the heart of Western civilization thing. Yeah. Um, we'd love to hear from more people on this. Yeah, absolutely. So... Um, and especially, like, if you're not in the United States, what do you think of... Oh, yeah. Send us what you, <laughs> what think, you think about the United States. Um, Please. Because that's, like, frankly, a little bit insulting yeah. to you guys. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, yeah, we will see you in another two weeks. Love it. Chapter six. Here we come. We're going to meet yep. the rest of Camp Half... What is it? Camp Half-Blood. Half Half-Blood. Let's do it. And they're orange t-shirts. Yay. Sounds good. All, All right. right. Bye, guys. Bye.